Hey all, Professor Tracy back with another contracts video. This one on anticipatory repudiation. So we're continuing our look at this subtopic of breach and repudiation. So remember, first we were establishing what the terms of the contract are, what those terms mean. Once we know that, we can then know our parties doing what they're supposed to be doing, what they committed to doing. And that allows us to determine breach. We saw that there are different kinds of breaches, that there are partial breaches, material breaches, and total breaches. Now we're looking at the question of what's called repudiation, which is when a party is indicating before the date of performance comes around that they may not perform or and they may flat out say they won't perform. So we're gonna look at that. What? It, how is the other party to respond in that sort of situation? What are their rights and what are their duties under the contract when the other party is either hesitating, uh, is suggesting they may have doubts about performance or uncertainty, or flat out saying they won't perform at all. So let's jump into that. We're gonna look at an example and use that to frame our discussion here. So let's assume that you and I have a contract and me being me, uh, you'll see that that may there may be some difficulty for you because of uh, how much I may or may not be willing to commit. So here, uh, I am promising to dog sit for you for the week of June 19th. And in return, you are promising to pay me $200 for doing so for that one week of watching your dog. And uh, we know, as we've just talked about, we've talked about conditions and the order of performance. And because my performance takes a period of time and yours is just the payment of money, which can be done more or less instantaneously, I'm going to perform first, you're going to perform second. So I need to go first. And so leading up to performance is this time we're looking at. If we're counting out from today, uh, on if we're going from the date I'm recording this from, then uh, we, we are looking at, uh, I believe it's the 10th or the 9th. I, I don't even know, I have to look. But uh, if we're looking at this, I believe it's the 10th. If we're going from April 10th moving forward, then June 19th is still a little bit of way. And now we're looking at that time period. And so we know that performance is due starting on June 19th. And let's say that in May, I start making noises, as I put it here, that I may not perform. And what would those noises be? Well, typically it would be me saying, well, I may have some sort of conflict. I'm not sure it's actually gonna work out after all. I'm not sure I'll still be available. Those kinds of expressions of doubt, noises of, or just complaining of, ah, I shouldn't have committed, that kind of thing. And what are your options? Well, one option would be what I titled here is wait and see. You can just say, I'm gonna wait around and see if Tracy will perform when the 19th of June comes. Another possibility would be to say, you know what, I'm just gonna treat Tracy as having repudiated, despite the fact that we've already made a contract, I'm going to assume that these noises amount to a repudiation of the contract and terminate the agreement and hire somebody else to do it. Another possibility is to request what's called adequate assurance. We're gonna explore each of these options in great detail in just a second. So let's, as we look at these options, what do they mean? If we start and say, well, wait and see, wait and see if Tracy breaches, what does that mean? So that is what I described, which is to wait and see if I'm going to perform. Because remember, the date of performance is still in the future, and that's why this whole question of anticipatory repudiation or a possible anticipatory repudiation comes about at all, is that the party is signaling that they may breach or they might flat out say they will be. Um, and But wait and see is going, you know what? I'm gonna wait and see and make sure there are, they're not gonna perform. Form. And if that is true, then it would just be an ordinary breach, right? So if you were to wait and for the data performance to roll around and I don't show up, then that's just an ordinary breach. And you go back to that material we covered about distinguishing between a partial breach and a material breach and all of that. But uh, so, and we wouldn't have to worry about any of this stuff about repudiation. 
So what are the pluses and the minuses of this approach? They're probably pretty obvious, but one of them is the certainty. The positive thing is you as the potentially injured party or potentially non-breaching party, that you are the party that you are not jumping the gun. If you were to say, oh, this is definitely a breach, he's repudiated, and you're wrong because the court doesn't think it's a breach, then you, you're, you yourself would be in breach. So there's not that uncertainty because the data performance would come and it would go, and I, Tracy, would not have shown up to watch your just dog sit for you, and therefore you would know for sure that I breached. The other side of this is it it is in a sense gracious right that you are giving an opportunity to the other party to correct their own fault so even if i have indicated i don't plan to perform you are extending grace to me and you're avoiding litigation and and giving me an opportunity to correct my own wrongdoing on my own that is ideal right but maybe too idealistic if somebody particularly since somebody has said it may have said they won't perform, right? Depending on how certain they are in their proclamations to you. So the downside to this is I get at here, right? You can see the minus there is you may just be wasting your time, which is you are waiting around, hoping that I will change my mind or being sort of naively optimistic when if I've already clearly signaled I'm not going to perform, then all you're doing is wasting your time and putting yourself in this last thing. What you can see is you may not be able to get the requested performance at all. If you're ready to head out of town on June 19th and only then are you like, oh, Tracy isn't in fact showing up. Now you're in a difficult spot because you might have a plane to catch or a cruise to jump onto or whatever and you can't do it because of the fact that you had somebody lined up and you gave me the benefit of the doubt, you made your situation worse by waiting around. Although it's a gracious thing to do, it is often a foolish thing, but it needs to, it will have to uh, depend, we'll see, on how certain are the signals coming from me, the party that's saying, you know, indicating that they may not perform. That's important to know. So if I say here, right, here's if we're continuing with this example and I've changed it, see, where I say not just that I'm giving, making noises I won't perform. I, if I'm saying this, I'm not sure I will be able to dog sit for you. Okay, if that's my statement, then it may make sense if you choose to wait and see. And there that may make sense. I'm expressing doubt. Right? I'm saying, you know what? Something has come up. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to dog sit for you, but I may be able to. I'm just not sure. So that is not a clear, unequivocal statement that I won't be performing. It's an indication of doubt. So if you say, I will wait and see, then you that means you're going to wait and see if I show up when. If I'm going to wait, show up on June 19th to dog sit for you. And if not, then you sue me for breach, right? Because that is just a breach. You don't have to worry about repudiation because the date a performance has come. I didn't show up and that's a breach. So that would be how wait and see unfolds. Well, what about anticipatory repudiation? We need to think about how this happens, right? Unlike breach, a repudiation is when a party is indicating ahead of time, right? As we say here, before performance is due, the party makes an unequivocal and definite statement that they will not perform when performance is going to come due. They're saying ahead of time, before it's due, they're unequivocally and definitely making a statement they'll do it. Or they're engaging in conduct that renders them unable to perform when the data performance is ro rolls around. So either they're making a, a, an unequivocal and definite statement before performance is due, or they've engaged in conduct that makes them that makes it so they will they will be unable to perform when performance comes due. So what's our analytic framework for anticipatory repudiation? We're going to ask, has the party repudiated? If they have, we're going to say, well, what's the rights of the non-repudiating party? If we were sticking with the example with you and I, then I would be the party repudiating. If in fact I have, then the question would be, what rights do you have 
as the non-repudiating party. And then we need to think about, though, the possibility of retracting a repudiation. Sometimes a party may repudiate and they may later retract that repudiation. We'll see when that can be done and if so, how. So has a party repudiated the contract? We said a repudiation is done in two ways, right? Two ways. It's and that we said one, it's done before performance is due that it's either an unequivocal and definite statement or, and this is something to keep in mind, it, keep in mind a good faith dispute is not necessarily a repudiation. So if the party is bringing up something that it, in good faith that is a dispute, that there's some problem or issue that has arisen as, uh, as perform the date of performance is approaching or if there's ongoing performance when that performance is expected to be completed, that there's some ongoing dispute and there's the possibility of conduct as a repudiation. So taking each of these up, the timing here, the timing with repudiation is it has to be done before performance is due. We just said perform when we did wait and see that timing is key because if the date of performance has come and gone, then that wouldn't be a repudiation. If it's before performance is due, repudiation. If it's when performance is due or after, it's a breach. So we said we also need either an unequivocal and definite statement or conduct. Unequivocal and definite statement meaning what? That it needs to be that the party is what? They are threatening a material breach. When they say something, what they're saying is whatever they're saying they won't do is threatening a material breach breach. So keep in mind that means if what they're saying is something like I can match the paint on the wall or on the uh, of your shingles but realize it's technically not the exact same uh, same shingle uh, coloration or style but unless you're right up on the roof looking at them next to ne next to each other you won't be able to tell then that's probably not a material breach even though it may be a breach because they're not giving you the right shingle on the roof but if it's if it's what they're saying is this is the way it's going to be i'm sorry then that would be a partial breach is it still a potential breach that they're threatening yes but it could not be a repudiation because what they're threatening to do or telling you they're going to do ain't a material breach. And so mere expressions of doubt, like I'm not so sure I'm going to be able to perform, do not constitute a repudiation. The person is saying, I'm not sure it's going to work out. So a statement repudiating must be made directly to the other party. This is key. If it's said to somebody else and you just get wind of it, this does not make it a repudiation. You must get it from the other party. So, and just reading about it in the newspaper will also not be a repudiation, right? It's got to be a statement from the other party made directly to you. So not through another party, not through another medium like a newspaper. So you've got to get it directly from that person. And we'll see that this is different when we start thinking about adequate assurance, which is one of the other possible responses to when there is a situation where one party is expressing they may or may not perform. So one of the things I said is we said, okay, there's the timing of a repudiation has to be before performance is due. If they're making, if the, repu if the repudiation is done through words, it has to be a clear and definite unequivocal statement and we said that it that statement it has to be of a material breach and coming directly from the other party and the if what the person is raising is a good faith dispute then that is not a repudiation repudiation means you're acting in bad faith you're refusing to perform so that's important to keep in mind so conduct is also a repudiation. So realize a good faith dispute, what you might say, well, what's the, what do you mean? That if there's some genuine dispute, say uh, that you and I are nailing down, say exactly, if I'm dog sitting for you, maybe there is some dispute about, well, I'm supposed to be going away to 
uh, help my mom with something and I had told you I, I think I'd like to take the dog, my plan would be to take the dog with me, you have concerns about that, and we have a little bit of dispute whether that's going to work out or not. That is a good faith dispute about that part of the job. That is not a repudiation just because you and I are having a disagreement about some part of the job. So here, conduct is a repudiation. There, there's somebody shooting themselves in the foot. That's what we mean here, where someone is engaging in conduct, right, that they are making their, their performance impossible. So ahead of time, they're doing something that makes it impossible for them to perform when the data performance rolls around. And so that's in a repudiation, although it's not words, it's not a definite and unequivocal statement. Through their conduct, they have made it so they cannot perform. So we've looked at this question of repudiation. What are the rights of, like, has the party repudiated? We've talked about how that might be. So what are the rights of the non- If there is a repudiation, what does it look like? So the non-repudiating party may what? Suspend their performance they can, they can terminate the contract if they want, and they can sue for breach. That should sound familiar. It should sound like a material breach. That if that's, that's matured into a total breach, such that the contract can be terminated without liability. So if in fact the party has repudiated, then you can suspend your performance, you can give the party time to retract that repudiation, and, but you don't have to. You can suspend your performance, terminate the contract, sue for breach if you want. Remember, you don't have to sue. You can just say, I'm walking away. I'm just going to hire somebody else to dog sit for me. I'm not interested in pursuing a lawsuit. But you could if you want to because it's the equivalent of a breach if I've repudiated. And so here, right, you're not required to terminate. You're not required to um it, to sue. So here where I say, I said, just mentioned you're not required to sue, not required to terminate either. You could sit back and hope that they're going to change their mind. Give them a chance to change their, to retract their repudiation and to, uh, to perform. So you could do that, but obviously there are potential downsides, much like the wait and see approach. So what happened? How does somebody retract their repudiation? A retraction of repudiation, a repudiating money to try do this, what they may retract any time before performance is due. However, however, this is key, that the right of retraction is going to terminate, right? You have the retracting party or the repudiating party has a right to retract that repudiation any time prior to performance unless the other party what? They give notice that they're terminating, right? They give notice they're treating the contract as rescinded or terminated, that they're treating this as a breach and they're suing, right? That's a repudiation. They can say, I'm suing on this. So they're giving notice that they're terminating the contract, that they're suing on the contract, or that they materially change position, whether they give notice of that or not. What would that look like? You hire somebody else to dog sit for you. It would make sense on your end to go ahead and give notice you're terminating and then to hire to be safe, but you can just materially change your position and you no longer have a right to retract. That should make sense, right? If if I if you have relied on my repudiation by changing position, then I, my right to retract should be gone and that's the case. So what about repudiation? The positive here is you are not, the problem with wait and see was you're wasting time and potentially putting yourself in a position where performance may never happen, right? May never happen. And the positives obviously with repudiation are just the opposite. If I treat this, if I say, no, you've repudiated, I treat it as anticipatory repudiation, then I'm not wasting my time or my resources, I'm saying, I am suspending my own performance, I'm terminating the contract and I'm suing if I want to, then I'm not, I'm not waiting around for a performance that may never come. And I'm also, I'm, I can seek out somebody else to, if it's you, you can seek out somebody else to dog sit for you so you're not in a bind if I don't show up. Obviously, it's potentially risky. You might say, well, why? Because you are reading the other party. They're either their conduct 
or the statement that they have made to you, and you are going, in my assessment, this is a definite and unequivocal statement that they will not perform. And you're also saying, I don't think whatever dispute is here is a good faith dispute. You're making a bunch of judgment calls about what you think the result should be. And so, but you might be wrong uh, because you are in the thick of things and you have your own opinion about how right I am or the other party is and how wrong you may feel. You feel you've been wrong by them and therefore you may not be seeing things clearly. And you look at it and go, it's a repudiation, which means what? If you go ahead and go, I am suspending my own performance, I am terminating my the contract and walking away or suing, then guess what? If you were wrong, you yourself are in breach. You yourself are the wrongdoer. And that is a bad thing. The other thing, obviously, is it forces you to go back to the drawing board and find somebody else. You could say, if we view being gracious as a positive thing, it removes that possibility of sort of a change of heart or repentance from the other party and them sorting it out. Uh, that's removed. So if we look and go, okay, I if this is the situation, if I've said this statement to you, read it, read it here, don't go, I've seen this before, your ugly little diagram before here, Tracy. Well, no, not quite, not this one. So this one says, I quit, I'm not going to watch your dumb dog for you. Okay, there, that is a definite and unequivocal statement. I'm not going to watch your dumb dog for you. But we made a contract way back here, right? On the 10th, we said we have a contract. And, but in fact, I'm going, I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to watch your dog. So you go, well, that's, that's a repudiation. And if that's true, that's it. You terminate the contract, suspend performance, and sue. And in this case, you're probably right because my statement seems pretty definite and unequivocal, right? Realize that it would be clear. Now, keep in mind here, I would have a right to retract my repudiation, right? Because people don't usually do all three of these things immediately. Um, you hypothetically could, but you in unless and until you hire somebody or you give me notice if that you you are terminating the contract um that and or remember that you have to either give me notice you've terminated the contract notice that you're suing on the contract or you materially change position and find somebody else otherwise i would have a right to retract my repudiation so for thinking about do just looking at some basic multiple choice questions from the materials that I use my own students saying uh, it occurs when, well, we know this, we know that it's before performance is due, right? So not very difficult. This is a straight sort of recall question, doesn't require a lot of analysis. A party may retrudi repudiate a contract, how? It says by words only, only in writing, either by words or conduct would write. Realize the words don't have to be in writing, so this is this is there's sort of a false dichotomy at work in some of these answer choices here. It, it's done. It's either done by words or by conduct, right? So C would be the correct answer there. The words can be oral. They can be written. Don't matter. So, so what about three? Three says upon repudiation, the non-repudiating party has the right to do what? Well, we've said this, right? They can suspend their performance. They can terminate the contract. They can sue for breach. They can do all of those things. And it says the repudiating party has a right to retract the repudiation up until the non-repudiating party does what? It gives notice that the contract, yep, that's true. That would cut off the right to retract the repudiation. Treats it as a breach by bringing suit, yep, that would, that would cut off the right. Although, obviously, there's supposed to be notice there, but that's sort of inherent if I'm bringing a lawsuit that presumably you're getting notice of that. I'm serving you with it. Um, and, or I materially change it, but you materially change the position of reliance. Yes, all of those. We love those. All of those, any of those would terminate the right to retract the repudiation. And now we have this question. It says, buyer and seller enter into a land sale contract where the delivery of the deed to the land. 
free of any encumbrances and payment of the purchase price is to be one month after signing the agreement. Okay, so they enter into it, we have a delay. Obviously, it wasn't a delay, then repudiation's not an issue, right? If everything happens right after the contract's formed, there's not gonna be time for anyone to repudiate it. But here, it says, they form it, performance is a week later, a week, um, a week after the, the buyer and the seller are into the contract, seller uses the land as security for a $100,000 loan, which is due in six months, okay? Did seller repudiate the contract by mortgaging the property? Explain your reasoning. Well, they have three weeks to unmortgage the property. And here, this is difficult, right? Because you could look at this, right? And say, well, yeah, but they could still perform. They could still make it do. But if they promise to deliver it free of any encumbrances, then they put themselves in a spot where it indicates by their conduct, right? Not by anything they've expressed to the buyer, but by their conduct. Is it impossible? No. So we could say, well, Tracy, your slide said it had to be impossible. Is it impossible? No. But it is conduct that indicates that they, they are not in a clear position to perform three weeks later. If in fact this, and we'll see, this is where the next option might be the ideal option because this is a situation where you're like, hmm, I really think you may not be able to perform uh, given what you've done. It seems like if you didn't have the money and you needed to put this aside to secure a loan for, that it's gonna come due six months from now, then that greatly concerns me here. Um, if you would probably want more facts. As I've said here, you, this is likely you could probably treat this as a repudiation, that it probably constitutes a repudiation here um, uh, by conduct. But we'll see that maybe the next option of what's called seeking adequate assurance might be the best, although three weeks is not a lot of time. So here, employer-employee enter into an agreement where employer will work at employer's office for six months, starting in one week. The, the day after making the agreement, employee embarks on a round-the-world cruise that will last one year. Employer sees employee get, get on the ship and watches the ship leaves the dock with employee waving goodbye from the deck of the ship. As employee repudiated the contract, explain your reasoning. This is pretty straightforward, right? For um, they're going to, they're supposed to start work in one week, but this employee just got on a round-the-world cruise that... Um, is going to last a whole year. So this is not going to happen, right? They're not able to start the job in one week. So this one's much clearer than the other one. Uh, this is this is a clear repudiation, right? So this being our answer here, that this is a clear repudiation, right? It's a year-long voyage that by their conduct, they've made it impossible for them to perform. So this is straightforward repudiation by conduct. So at seven, seven says on July one, buyer and seller entered into a contract for the sale of Black Acre for $150,000 with a closing date of October one. On August one, buyer tells seller he thinks he made a mistake and the Black Acre is not worth $150,000. Buyer asks seller reduce the price by $10,000. Seller refuses. On September one, buyer sends seller an email stating, you are asking too much for Black Acre. I'm not going, I'm not buying it for $150,000 and will not be at the closing unless you lower the price by $10,000. Seller makes no response. On October 1, buyer does not show up at closing. When would have been the earliest that seller could have brought a breach of contract lawsuit? Well, here, when if we're looking at this, they make a contract, right? It says on July 1, they make this contract. On August 1, what we have is buyer saying, I think I made a mistake that the property's not worth that. Buyer then asks in that same communication, hey, would you reduce the price by 10,000? Seller says, no, they're not obligated to drop it. They already have a contract. So a month later, buyer then says, you're asking too much. I'm not buying it for $150,000 and will not be at the closing unless you lower the price by 10,000. Now, we have a definite unequivocal statement that the person is not going to perform as agreed and unless they do the buy, the seller gives in to something they 
don't need to give in to. They don't have to lower the price. They already have a contract. So I would say the soonest would be September 1 when we have that. So that would be it, right? September 1. So that would be the date of the repudiation. And at that point, this realize the seller could suspend their performance, terminate the contract, and immediately sue for breach. So what about this last option I referenced, particularly in response to a situation where a person encumbers the property, it's not technically impossible for them to perform, but it sure raises a lot of questions. And we said there's this problem, potential problem with anticipatory repudiation, when if the non-repudiating party moves forward, when they, have, they are not necessarily reading the situation clearly, that it's not as definite and unequivocal as they think, or the conduct is not so clearly put the other party in a position where it's impossible for them to, per, to perform when the date of performance rolls around. So what do they do? So whether we're under the common law or the UCC, you may ask for adequate assurance when? The standard for adequate assurance is you have to have reasonable grounds for insecurity reasonable grounds for insecurity. So with a repudiation, you have to either have definite and unequivocal statement that the party's not going to perform, or you have to have conduct that the party's engaged in that makes it impossible for them to perform when the date of performance comes around. But to request adequate perform adequ adequate assurance, all I need is reasonable grounds for insecurity. So what are we asking? We need to know when we're thinking about this, does the party actually have reasonable grounds for insecurity? And if they can't, if they do, then that gives them grounds for demanding adequate assurance. But have they done so? Have they made a demand? And then if they have, has the other party provided adequate assurance of performance? Adequate assurance of performance. So does the party have reasonable grounds for insecurity? Well, how do we know? What is it? If the, the party has a belief that the other party will breach and that it's reasonable in light of the, particular, the, the, the facts and the circumstances of the particular case and realize the facts that they're pointing to, to say, I have reasonable grounds for insecurity must have arisen after formation, because if they existed at formation, you should have addressed them before you entered into the agreement or as part of the negotiation process leading to the agreement. So we can't, you can't later, you, you know, go back to those facts and go, well, I'm still feeling real insecure. Well, if you did, you did, you should have dealt with it. But if something happens later, then that gives you grounds for demanding adequate assurance. So these are tied, right? If it's a risk I took when I formed, when I entered into the agreement, then I can't use that now to demand adequate assurance. And that should make sense. So when, this is a big one. If you find out the other party is having financial troubles, you see they file for bankruptcy, you see that they've made some sort of announcement and their stock is starting to tank that they're because of their financial position. You find out something about it and you might be like, but Tracy, you said that repudiation can't come from a third party. It has to come directly from the other party. I did, but guess what can come from a third party source? The grounds for demanding adequate assurance. I can have reasonable grounds for insecurity just by reading about something, hearing about something, talking to somebody else. And so that's okay. So things like financial trouble or somebody's labor strike, or they have some sort of, there's a shortage of essential supplies that arise. And why, you might say, well, why are those, how does this all fit in? Because they make me think you may not be able to perform. You've encumbered the property to, with $100,000 worth of debt that you're supposed to give me in three weeks, debt free. That gives me some grounds for insecurity because I don't know, because if you needed to secure it with that property for the, to begin with, that gives me a lot of doubt about whether you can pay it off in three weeks. So here, indirect communication, as I just said, the grounds for insecurity, it may be indirect, but if it's you're talking about 
repudiation, it must come directly from the other party. So there is a difference there, right? Has the party made a demand for adequate assurance of performance? The answer here is how do you how do you do this? You suspend your performance, you demand adequate assurance. The form of demand, it, this is important to understand, that it will differ depending on whether we're under the UCC or the common law. Under the common law, it doesn't specify. The restatement does not say. But under the UCC, it says it must be in writing. It must be in writing. So if you lack a basis, right, if you... It, it, so the, what is this getting at here is if you actually don't have reasonable grounds for insecurity and you suspend your performance and demand that the other party provide adequate assurance, you yourself are in breach by doing so because you're not acting in good faith, right? You, you have no basis for suspending your performance and demanding them that they assure you that they're going to be able to perform, so here, what about this? Has the other party provided adequate assurance? What does that look like? What is adequate assurance? Well, if the other party gives adequate assurance, then everything just carries on merrily, right? Like, oh, my concerns are relieved. I see that although you've had this financial hiccup, you're actually fine. This contract's going to be performed A-OK. -okay. If it's not given, if they don't, respond at all, which is a frequent thing. If somebody is a frequent thing that a party will do, if they can't provide any adequate assurance, then they're going to try to ignore it, right? They will often try to ignore it. Not always, but that there are, you can find plenty of cases where that's what happens. And so there, it's pretty easy to say, did they provide adequate assurance? No, they didn't respond at all. So that is, so either if it's provided and it's just not adequate, which we'll talk about in a second, or they don't respond at all, then that means that will be treated as a repudiation, right? Once you ask for adequate assurance and the other party doesn't provide it, that is a repudiation. So that's, remember, this is predicated on our step of, well, did the party actually have reasonable grounds for security? They had to, otherwise, they, the other party, if you did not have that, then there would be no grounds for asking for that. What is adequate? It's a question of fact. So we have to decide what's going to solve their insecurity. So the party demanding it has to go, what would solve my insecurity? I am feeling insecure. About what? Why? And what would help to make clear that up? If it's financial condition, then maybe it's looking, you know, them providing their, you know, access to financial documents or things or, you know, bank account balances or other things that would assure you that they're able to provide, that they're going to be able to perform. If it's a labor strike, then it may be something, you know, an indication to you of this is going to resolve quickly. Here's why we think that. Or, you know, here's we're actually bringing other workers in um, to cover while these people are striking. And so no worries. There's not going to be a lot of downtime, whatever it may be. And so that's here. We're going the party getting it and receiving is the one deciding if it's adequate. Now, it, here, the thing that's obviously not adequate is somebody going, don't worry, I'll perform. It's going to be okay. It's got to be that you are doing that. Usually just a verbal assurance or written assurance is not okay. Now, I guess there could be circumstances where it might be, depending on the specific facts of the case and the relationship between the parties. But in a lot of cases, the answer is going to be no. I need something more than a, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. It, you know, I'll perform. I know you read we filed for bankruptcy, but don't worry, we're good. So that you need something more than that. And so if we look at this, what's an example of what's adequate? So if we look at this, and we'll obviously go back to the dog sitting example in a minute, but if you and I, we can track for me, you're going, uh, I'm going to buy your home for $4,000. 
or 400, now 4,000, that'd be quite, probably not quite much of a home. But you're in law school, right? A $4,000 home might be all you can afford. Um, so you hear what? That I am in having financial difficulty, that I've defaulted on several of my debts, say outstanding loans, credit cards, whatever it may be. And you then request adequate assurance from me. I provide verified financial statements showing here's my available funds, right? So here's my account balance, here's what's available, here's what I'm covering and not. What you've heard is not, you don't really need to be concerned about. Remember, it doesn't matter that it's incorrect. That So you had reasonable grounds for insecurity if you got wind that I was defaulting on these on debts. So you that would cause you to think, hmm, I wonder if Tracy can actually afford to buy a $400,000 a $400, home. So those are all valid things. So it seems like this works out fine. So as we think, well, what are the plus and minuses of, of demanding adequate assurance? There's a lot of good things, right? Because one of the good things about it is you are, it's eliminating this risk of breaching, although not entirely, right? Because if you don't, in fact, have reasonable grounds for insecurity, then you, you put yourself in breach if you suspend your performance and demand adequate insurance. But... It avoids this jumping straight to saying, oh, there's a repudiation. It allows you to go, I'm not feeling good about what I have found out or what seems like that the other party may not perform or, or the doubts they've expressed to me. So I want some assurance that they're actually going to perform. And that's the beauty of it. And it allows you to seek this, right? And, and it allows something, it allows you to move things forward to get a resolution rather than just waiting around. So it avoids sort of the extremes of both of the other, the wait and see approach and sort of, uh, and jumping right to repudiation. Now keep in mind, do not read me to be saying you never treat something as a, as a repudiation right away. No, you absolutely do because sometimes it absolutely is a repudiation. And sometimes it's absolutely clear that you should probably cool your pets and not do anything and just kind of wait and see, you know, the person's whatever, complaining, they're hemming and hawing, they're expressing uncertainty. But it's best to just sit back and, and cool your pets for a minute and see what happens before you plow ahead with doing anything one way or the other. So that so but this is a middle ground. If you're in a situation where you're like, ah, I'm not where it's very clear that the person it, it's not clear. Right. You it, it, the problem here is even if you do get adequate assurance, that doesn't guarantee performance. That's all this negative is saying. Right. None, none of this is a guarantee one, at one way or the other. Right. And the it's possible that you misjudge, as I mentioned up front, you, you still need to be sure that you had reasonable grounds for insecurity. So you still couldn't misjudge. But it, it is it is much less of an extreme thing than terminating the agreement and suing. So if we go back to my example, if I say to you, my statement isn't, I'm not going to watch your dumb dog, but my mom is sick. I may need to go see her. It could end up being the week of June 19. Okay. I've raised to you something which is like, I don't know. This is a concern. I may need to go deal with her. Right. You say, well, I want assurance. I, if you're going to, you know, you've caused me concern. I have reasonable grounds for insecurity. And I have sowed those, those doubts in your mind. And so if I say to you, right, you ask Tracy to confirm that he will not make plans to visit his mom the week of June 19th. And I provide you with a copy of my plane ticket showing I'll be traveling the week of July 3rd, right? So not till July will I be going so I say, yep, I get it. Here's the assurance. You don't need to worry. I'm going to be there. I haven't, you know, booked my travel here in a way that's going to conflict. So that would be the kind of resolution of everything there. If instead, right, I could, I could provide the adequate assurance or I could not. If I refuse, as this says, then that would be a repudiation, right? You could terminate, you could terminate the contract then and you could sue, right? You could terminate the agreement, suspend your performance, terminate the agreement, sue if you want to. And you would want to do one of those things and provide notice or change your position in order to cut off my right to retract. Which of the following is the most accurate statement concerning adequate assurance of performance? So adequate assurance, remember that this is obviously 
directly wrong. You have to have reasonable grounds for insecurity. Um, and here you have to have a good faith basis before suspending, right? So C seems like the right answer, meaning it can't just be either you're overly insecure, like you're overly sensitive, or that you're making something up and just being difficult, but that you have actual good faith basis for your reasonable grounds for insecurity. So that's it. I hope that's helpful. Um, so keep in mind, don't look at that and go, wow, again, that one approach is always preferred to another. You wanna look at what the facts call for. And any of those approaches may or might, may not be applicable depending on how things unfold. But I do hope that's helpful. And as always, if it was, it's very helpful if you like and subscribe. And uh, I will be back with more videos moving forward. We're going to be moving into remedies uh, in the next couple weeks. So I hope everyone's doing well and uh, there'll be more to come. Bye.